Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on gaining insight from the world's best macro minds. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. We are here with you today to discuss U.S. debt health and a breakdown of America's historical financial health and strategies. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube at Public Invest for in-depth interviews to help keep your portfolio on track. Today, we are here with Jamie Catherwood, founder of Investor Amnesia. Jamie, welcome to Public. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be chatting with you. Yeah, I know. I'm excited to hear about your opinions on debt. So before the show started, you were talking about the fact that the United States was founded in default. Can you explain what that means and how that's even possible? Yeah, so um, it's funny every time uh, we approach one of these kind of debt ceiling crises, which seems to happen every other week uh, for the last year, um, people start to say, you know, the U.S. has never defaulted on its debt and, you know, it'll be catastrophic if we do that for the first time ever. But the reality is, is that the U.S. has defaulted a few times. Um, they're kind of more wonky defaults, but going back to the very inception of the United States, um, the country was essentially founded in default um, because after the Revolutionary War, the United States had taken on a lot of debt to finance that war against the British, um, and so specifically from France. So when Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, comes in as the first Treasury Secretary, we owed, um, let me look at the numbers here, something like for close to $80 million uh, in debt in 1790. And that was a bad situation because there was also no kind of government revenue system set up. Um, because if anyone remembers AP US history class, we had the Articles of Confederation before the Constitution. And because everyone was so scared of giving a central government too much power over taxation, um, the, the central government had no ability to collect taxes. So there was no revenue coming in. So you had no revenue and then 80 million in debt. Um, and so Hamilton's first task was to basically figure out how to get out of this situation. Um, and he went to Congress and put forward a few reports, one on public credit, where he suggested that basically we had to go to people holding U.S. bonds at that time and say, we can't afford to pay you the 6% yield. Uh, we need you to essentially accept 4% yield. Um, and there's some embarrassing letters where Hamilton wrote to uh, the French government asking if we could pay them back later than we had promised. Uh, and it'd be a big benefit to the U.S. Uh, and he had to also write to President Washington saying we have something like one hundred and eighty five thousand dollars in expenses next month and we have 50 grand in the Treasury. So some congressional checks are literally going to bounce and Congress uh, members aren't going to get paid if we don't figure something out. And so while we love to say that it, we've never defaulted, uh, we were actually founded in default. Um, and that's why kind of Hamilton is known for being this genius as he helped mm -hmm. us get out of that tricky situation. Yeah. And him and Tom Thomas Jefferson butt heads quite a bit on national banks and all of that stuff, like Hamilton was very pro banking, Jefferson maybe not so much. So, could you talk about that and how the you know the banking system was so important to establish the stability of the United States? Yeah. So, in 1790, Hamilton goes back uh, in front of Congress and gives his report on a national bank, and essentially he had studied other banks around Europe, in particular, um, and the Bank of England specifically, and kind of came to the conclusion that in order to you know, provide stability in financial markets and the economy, you kind of needed some sort of national banking authority to help regulate um, regulate markets. And so he put forth this idea for a national bank, which was very, uh, very contentious and was the subject of a lot of debate. Um, I think that the reason it ended up uh, getting done is there was a famous secret meeting. I can't remember at which founding fathers uh, addressed in New York, but essentially putting the capital um, where they did was kind of a peace offering. And so that helped get it passed. But yeah, it was a very uh, contentious issue, which makes sense because again, this is all within the context of just finishing a war against a strong central government uh, in the King of England. And so anything to do with power rested in one central authority related to the government was a uh, viewed very negatively, but the bank was founded and lasted until I think 18, early 1800s. And then that was abolished. And then there was the second bank of the United States. But um, 
the first bank in the United States was interesting because it was one of the mechanisms that Hamilton used to get rid of this massive debt burden the United States had because he offered to American debt holders um, the ability to pay for shares of this new bank in the United States, which IPO'd on July 4th of all dates. Um, it's like the most American IPO. Uh, but he allowed people to use their bonds to get shares. And so that was kind of a win-win where you could just convert your shares uh, or convert your bonds into shares of a, an exciting new company. And also for the U.S. government, that helped retire a lot of the debt that had been outstanding. Um, and it's interesting because he, uh, Hamilton wrote in a letter to, I think, Washington stating that he was essentially trying to do correctly what John Law had done incorrectly in the Mississippi bubble with this idea of debt for equity swaps. Um, it's kind of interesting to see something associated with one of the biggest bubbles in history then be used to successfully help get the U.S. Uh, out of its debt debt burden. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, so they they took this bank and they IPO'd the bank and then that helped the U.S. government to pay off some existing debt? Yeah, so essentially, um, let me pull up the exact stats here. So the Bank of the United States went public on July 4th, 1791. And there were 25,000 shares issued with a, at a par value of $400 a share. 25% of each share was payable in species, so gold, silver, et cetera. And then 75% of a share was purchasable in the debt securities, so U.S. bonds. And so if you were an investor and you held a bunch of U.S. bonds, instead of having to take other money and go buy shares of this um, IPO, you could use your bonds that you already held to buy or basically convert your debt into equity in the Bank of the United States. And so because people were converting and essentially retiring this debt in exchange for um, shares of the Bank of the United States, it reduced the amount of debt outstanding and therefore the amount of interest that the government had to pay, which was the same concept that uh, was at the heart of the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi bubble in 1720 was the government after fighting expensive wars in Europe, trying to hype up uh, excitement around a government-related uh, company, the South Sea Company and Mississippi Company, and allow people to pay for shares using debt. Um, but that obviously led to a crazy mania that we still refer to 300 years later. Um, and so Hamilton realized, though, that parts of uh, that idea did make sense, and he implemented it successfully. Um, and so it was a kind of innovative way to get out of uh, this crazy debt load. Yeah. And it's funny now because the United States is facing quite a heavy debt load and there's worries about the United States being able to finance interest payments because the Federal Reserve has raised rates so high. So is there other examples of historical debt reductions that the U.S. has done similar to what Hamilton done he did here? I'm sure there are. Um but it's a long history, and that's just the one that I focused on. Um, mm -hmm. So from memory, I can't remember any, but that is kind of the, the big one. Um, and I find most interesting because it was like day one of being a country that we had to figure <laughs> out a problem similar to how we're trying to figure out today yeah. what to do about this massive and ever-growing debt load. Mm -hmm. And also in the um, slide deck that you have, you have Hamilton's debt restructuring plan, uh, slide 14, where you're talking about reducing bond yields from 6 to 4% without reducing principal. Uh, do you know how that was financed or how that was managed? Yeah, basically, um, Hamilton understood, again, going back to this idea of people being concerned over a too strong central authority, he knew that it would be impossible for him to raise taxes or issue new taxes. Um, because people would freak out. And so he essentially went to bondholders and said, I know what will happen if I introduce new taxes, but the reality is, is that you're holding bonds with a 6% yield and we just cannot pay you that 6% yield. So your choices are essentially either we can introduce new taxes to raise revenue enough so that we can pay that 6% yield, or you can accept uh, this debt restructuring where we will essentially give you a new package of debt securities that yield 4% um, and are structured more advantageously for the government. And in doing so, you're ensuring that the you know, financial health of the, our new country is, uh, is safe. And so he ended up saving 
I think it's here. It saved almost like one and a half uh, million dollars annually in interest payments for the U.S. government, which was huge. Um, and it was really successful because by September 1791, 50% of that debt had been converted. And by 1794, 98% of the debt had been converted. Um, it's almost impossible to, under, like, to imagine something like that happening now um, and being so successful just with how divisive everything is. Uh, but yeah, he, he could thread that needle, I guess. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask you. Like, you know, we saw the Federal Reserve step up during the SVB crash and the Treasury step up and they did some huge financing uh, mechanics as well as during the COVID-19 crash um, and before that as well with 2008. But, you know, I feel like, do you feel like there could be this sort of big debt restructuring in the United States today or do you think it is too divisive? I feel like, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think that eventually something's going to have to happen. You know, I mean, we can't just keep complaining and saying, wow, this is crazy how much debt we have for just eternity and not do anything to change it. And clearly there's going to have to be something that diverges from kind of normal practice in order to make that happen. And so I do think it's now too divisive to do something like that, but I do feel like in the coming years or decades, something's going to be have, have to be done to address the problem, whether that's, kind of forcing people to accept lower yields or whatever it is, something has to be done to kind of change course. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be very divisive. I think almost ironically, Hamilton had it slightly easier because there was that kind of patriotism around, you know, the brand new country um, and not wanting to gain independence from Britain and then just, you know, go bankrupt and default immediately. Um, right. And so, yeah, I think, Whoever can galvanize the public to kind of get around this idea and tap into some patriotism in the, in the way that the U.S. has done over the course of its history through things like the Liberty Bonds, et cetera, um, something like that will have to be done to kind of get things in check. Yeah. Could you explain the mechanics of Liberty Bonds and how that was beneficial to the U.S.? Yeah, Liberty Bonds are really interesting. Um, I could talk about those for hours, um, but <laughs> essentially... To finance World War I, um, the U.S. government tried to split the financing between introducing a personal income tax and through liberty bonds, which were essentially just normal government bonds, um, but in smaller denominations. And they um, were specifically to finance World War I. And I think they were like $50. Um, and then you would receive like a $1 coupon or something like every six months. The idea was definitely not to make money um, as an investor really in these securities, but to fuel the war effort. Um, and so you can still see now a bunch of like marketing campaigns from that era, which are interesting um, with things like, you know, enlist in the army or invest. Um, and kind of those were the, it was a rallying cry and you had the famous Liberty Loan drives where um, celebrities like Charlie Chaplin and all these other celebs kind of came out and convinced people to do their part by buying these um, Liberty bonds. But what's interesting is that the process of buying these Liberty bonds introduced, you know, massive amounts of people, like millions of people to kind of the experience of investing in markets, even though it was in something kind of small like Liberty bonds. Um, what they found in the decade after uh, World War I was that areas of the country that had, had higher subscription rates to Liberty bonds, 10, 20 years later, those same areas had um, higher uh, stock ownership in amongst the population. And so there was a pretty direct link between introducing the average small investor to markets through Liberty bonds and then after the war, they still uh, maintain that interest in investing and kind of then transitioned into the stock market. Um, and so simultaneously helped fuel um, the financing for World War One, but also kind of introduced the birth of the American retail investor. That's so cool. And we're seeing the American retail investor really go after treasury bills and treasury bonds right now too, which is neat. Um, more people getting exposed to to markets and, you know, especially at the time when they're yielding so much. And I'm curious, you know, we're sort of talking about the U.S. national debt. Are there other periods in history where the national debt has behaved how it is now other than this Hamilton period, like where it has sort of ballooned and they've had to figure out how to manage it? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what's unique about the last 20 years or so is 
essentially before now, every big run up in um, U.S. debt was associated with a war. So during the War of 1812, again, towards the beginning of our nation's history, there was a big run up. Um, and then in World War One and World War Two, obviously, but also the Civil War. Um, it, I think like right on the eve of the Civil War, there's only twenty nine million um, dollars in federal debt outstanding. And then at the end of the Civil War, there was two point seven billion. Um, oh, so, geez. yeah, there's quite a run up. Um, and even that then when pales in comparison to World War One, where it went from like two point nine billion to twenty seven billion in just a few years. Um, but what's unique about today and the last 20 years is that the most recent run-ups have been associated with the 2008 financial crisis, so not a war, and then now COVID. Um, so it's kind of a divergence from history where it was almost always related to war financing to now we've had war-like expansion of debt levels, but without actual war um, driving that. Would you call this like I don't know, financial war or like, what would you call the, yeah. Yeah, I guess you could. Um, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah. But now that we're talking about this, it actually reminded me that another um, moment in U.S. history kind of around debt restructuring was after the Civil War. There was a lot of debate over uh, what to do with the debts of southern states um, and whether the U.S. government should assume yeah. those debts or um so that was another contentious moment. I guess if we got through that uh, civil war and figuring out that afterwards, that gives some hope for our ability to handle that today. Um, should be easier than after a literal civil war. <laughs> you would think. Yeah, I mean, this would be my last question. And it's sort of a prediction based question. But like, if you had to restructure the debt of the United States, given all that you know, and your expansive knowledge of history, like what would you recommend that we do the Hamilton plan or something different? I think that there has to be, I don't know, way above my pay grade to come up with the solution, yeah. but um, it seems to be above everyone's pay grade, I guess. Um, but I do think that there has to be something that ties into rewarding humans, like natural kind of human behavior. Um, I think that the, the most successful kind of government programs that have linked the public sector and private sector have been ones that understood and kind of catered to investor behavior, um, not necessarily positive investor behavior, but like the um, railway expansion in the 1800s, that was fueled by the government essentially saying for every mile of track that you build as a railway company, we'll give you $1,600 and like 40 acres of land. And so obviously everyone just started building railroads because it was this ridiculous government subsidy and you could get rich by building all these railroads. And so we got a national railway network. And again, that's tapping into just our natural speculation. And same with Hamilton, um, kind of understanding that if you can drum up excitement for this new bank in the United States stock, then people will be willing to convert their debt into uh, stock. And so I think whatever the solution is today, it needs to offer some sort of incentive for people. So whether that is I don't know how that would really work today, but a debt for equity swap, um, mm -hmm. I think it just has to kind of tie in to that uh, human behavior element so that people kind of get excited and the rest takes care of itself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. This has been awesome. Where can people find your work? Yeah, so if you uh, enjoy this kind of thing, uh, you can head over to my website, investoramnesia.com. Um, and if you are someone that likes courses, I have two online financial history courses there um, covering a lot of this stuff with lectures from people like Niall Ferguson, Jim Chanis, and Mark Andreessen. Um, so you can check those out and get 40% off if you hit summer 40 at checkout. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie.